Our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Charles Lane, who's a consultant plant pathologist at FIRA. And uh, Charles is going to talk to us about biosecurity and, uh, and the green infrastructure. Uh, thanks very much, Emily. I've uh, come down from Yorkshire, work for Ferris Science Limited, uh, and we provide a lot of advice to guidance, uh, not only to DEFRA, Forest Research, Forestry Commission, um, but also I've worked with a lot of organisations like the Arboricultural Association. My background is uh, I'm a plant pathologist, uh, so I get very excited about plant diseases. I'll probably use some very inappropriate and offensive language. I get quite excited about the damage that plant diseases cause. Um, but I've been involved in the last, uh, the first 20 years of my career was identifying new and emerging uh, fungal diseases. So I was the first person to identify Phytophthora morum uh, in the UK, so it's all my fault. Uh, and then for the last three to five years, I've been involved in working with outreach, citizen science, and trying to get people more involved in uh, plant health uh, and uh, biosecurity. Um, so it, uh, the journey we started on started back in autumn 2012 uh, when ash dieback was found for the first time in the natural environment. Uh, and today on the news this morning they talked about COBRA being called, uh, Cabinet Office Briefing Room A, to talk about the issues that we're having with uh, poisoning of, of, of former spies. Well, COBRA was called in 2012 to respond to the uh, perceived national emergency to do with ash dieback. Uh, and there were some very uh, excitable in exciting headlines that came up in the press. Uh, you know, ash trees were doomed. Uh, you know, 90% of our ash trees would become infected and die. Um, well, that was based on uh, that 90% of trees in Denmark had ash dieback. It's not the same as 90% of all ash trees are going to die. So you can get a lot of uh, public excitement about plant health and biosecurity, uh, but it does actually put it onto the political agenda. It does mean that uh, things may change. So... Um, the result of that was a major review of uh, tree health and plant health biosecurity in the UK. There was an expert uh, task force, but really what was important for me was the production of the new uh, plant biosecurity strategy 2014. And this really talked about, discussed and raised the issues to do with plant health and biosecurity. It was a very collaborative piece of work. It got a lot of people involved from stakeholders, members of the public, industry, government departments. How do we want plant health and biosecurity look? And there's a very clear statement on the vision of plant biosecurity for 2020 in that. What I'd like to do there is just uh, take a step back because we do, I have to say, bandy the phrase plant biosecurity around a lot of the time. And if you actually ask people what do you understand by biosecurity, I sort of know what it means, but I'm not quite sure what it means. But the definition is a series of precautions that aim to prevent the introduction and spread of harmful organisms. So they're the three key words, introduction, spread, and harmful organisms. What is also quite interesting, it's uh, derived from a, uh, a statement that came out in 2010. So really, plant biosecurity is a relatively new term to us. We've always talked about plant health and quarantine, but we now use the language of plant biosecurity. So just to pick up on a few of those points, we talk about what is a harmful organism. An ash tree, for example, can harbour 995 different organisms. How many of those are harmful? So again, you need to understand what is harmful. We tend to talk about pests and pathogens, pathogens that cause diseases. So we think about fungal, bacterial, viral pathogens. Um, but if, if, when, you when you look at the legislation, for example, they will lump pests and pathogens into one group called pests. Um, but we are talking about pests and pathogens. Uh, the other thing, again, to think about is this uh, interaction between the host at the top of the triangle, the environment at the right-hand side, and the harmful organism. And they will all work together to influence the amount of damage or the symptoms that you're going to see on the tree. And that classic triangle is quite important. So again, based on today's discussion, it is really important to understand the influence of the host and also the influence on the environment on the amount of damage that you might see caused by these different uh, harmful organisms. So that's a real fundamental principle of the work that I'm involved in. The second one is to think about uh, the contributing factors. What actually results in greater damage? What may actually result in that initial infection or infestation? So what are those contributing factors? We've talked a lot about the stressful environment today and how important that is for actually the vitality of the tree. That is also really important for us as plant pathologists to know the amount of damage that might occur. 
If you yourself, if you feel rather poorly and run down, you've not had a good night's sleep, you're feeling a little bit under the weather, you're going to be much more susceptible to uh, infection, common cold, flu, and things like that. Exactly the same for plants as well. So therefore, you know, those predisposing factors, what makes those more vulnerable to attack, what makes the plants able to defend and resist or tolerate them, and what will be the impact, what will be the amount of damage that you're going to see. So I always tend to think about these three things that are going to stress plants. I think about the horticultural values there. So again, we've talked a lot today about selecting the right tree for the right place. That is absolutely essential. If you have the wrong tree in the wrong place, that tree is going to be very, very stressed. It's going to be less vigorous and more likely to be susceptible to pest or diseases. And the damage you see is more likely to be uh, more considerable. Sustained aftercare is not just a matter of sticking in a tree in the ground and walking away. You need to look after that tree. It is like a young child. You need to nurture it and you need to make sure you bring it up properly. Um, Cultural factors, again, we've talked a lot about compaction, the difficult uh, urban environment. Anything that stresses the tree is going to make it more vulnerable, nutritional problems. And again, we've talked a lot about environment today as well. So we've talked about light, temperature. We want a healthy, vigorous tree, so it, therefore it is more resistant uh, to different types of pests and diseases. So again, just some underlying principles there about uh, biosecurity. The other thing we talked about when we talk about plant biosecurity is introduction and spread. I tend to think about introduction about the introduction of a pest or pathogen into a completely new area. That may be the first time it arrives in this country or a particular county. And spread tends to be the dispersal or the distribution of that particular pest or pathogen around that nursery, around that growing site, or in that park or urban environment. So it's all about thinking about the different pathways about how different pests and pathogens might be introduced to that area. For me, the highest risk is always going to be plants for planting. It's not surprising that pests and pathogens are more likely to be introduced on infected or infested plant material. Probably in this sort of environment as well, think about wood packaging materials as well. Many of the different pests that we encounter, things like Asian longhorn beetle, those wood boring beetles may be and have been shown to be introduced on infested packaging material that has not been treated properly. There was an outbreak of Asian longhorn beetle in this country. That was introduced, we believed, on wood packaging material on slate that had come in from China. That material should meet international regulations. It should be treated, so therefore it can't actually harbour those different pests and pathogens. But if that doesn't occur, then there very much is a likelihood of that's the way that material is going to come in. And then the other area that I would think about is contamination as well. Contamination, particularly of vehicles and machinery, with soil particularly, or possibly pests and pathogens. But that could be a major introduction route as well for you. Obviously, there's always natural routes. We can't stop things from blowing in. We can't stop things from coming in through river courses as well. Uh, so those are other sorts of vectors. Once it's arrived in that area, how is it going to spread around that area? Of course, there'll be the natural pathways of plants, water, soil, growing media and air. But again, it tends to be us as people. The actions that we take are going to be responsible for spreading those pests and pathogens around those sites. The way that we work, the way that we manage our equipment and our tools, the way that we move soil, and the way we allow things to happen on that site. So we are a major uh, issue for spreading uh, pests and pathogens once they have been introduced. One of the things which came out really well of the um, uh, strategy, the GB plant health strategy, first of all, we now have a, a chief plant health officer in DEFRA for England and Wales, who's based in York. That's Professor Nicola Spence. But we also have a UK risk register. And Nicola is responsible for looking after the UK risk register. Before the risk register, we had about 300 different quarantine listed pests and pathogens that we were concerned about. But we knew there were many more out there. So actually we developed a risk register that identified all the potential threats to the UK to do with uh, uh, pests and pathogens. The first iteration of that came out and we actually had 800 different pests and pathogens that we were worried about. Every year we add about 100 pests and pathogens to that list. So we now have nearly 1,000 pests and pathogens that we are concerned about. 
That is now all in the public domain, so you can all access that information. If you are out and about and traveling, going to different nurseries, talking to other people around the world, and they tell you about new pests and pathogens, we want to hear about that. We're interested in it. You are out there listening to people, talking to people, so everyone can access the UK Risk Register. Has anybody looked at the UK Risk Register? How many show of hands? Yeah, that's, that's pretty good, actually. We have more than 1%, which is great. So some of you are familiar with the UK Risk Register. You just go on to just Google UK Plant Health Risk Register. This box will pop up, and you can basically search for it. You can search if you're interested in a particular pest or pathogen. You can search for that and find out all the information we know about it. What might be more interesting to you is there's two options. One, you can search under a host. So you could search, say, Platanus and see what different pests and pathogens are listed on Platanus. If you want to do a more detailed piece of work, you can actually download the whole risk register onto an Excel spreadsheet, and then you can use that Excel spreadsheet to manipulate the data. So if you have a mix of genera that you want to plant or you're interested in, you can see the different types of pests and pathogens uh, that may be affecting those different plants. It's all about being prepared and being aware of what is going on. So I'd really encourage you to look at the UK Risk, risk Register, engage with it. If there's things which are wrong, tell us. If there's something that is new, tell us. We really want to hear about your experiences. As part of that GB strategy, that public outcry around ash dieback really demonstrated that people really cared about the trees and their natural environment. They wanted to do something. They wanted to be helpful. So actually, one of the key strands that comes out of the GB plant health strategy is, out, uh, is about greater awareness and greater involvement. And this is where I get involved. I'm uh, involved in a lot of projects <coughs> to do with citizen science, where we're actually trying to get members of the public, uh, people who volunteer their time, but also stakeholders uh, actually more involved in our plant health and biosecurity because we all are ultimately will share the pain. So we all need to actually uh, take a, a involvement in that. And the public want to get involved. The feedback we've had from citizen science has been fantastically positive. So just the way that we look at uh, the way that we deal with uh, plant health and biosecurity, it is a classic sort of triage situation. At the top of that triangle, you have the uh, National Plant Protection Organization, which for the UK is DEFRA, and we are the trained professionals. There's actually not very many of us. There's probably only three or 400 of us, which isn't a huge number of trained professionals. But there obviously is a large number of volunteers, and there's a large number of members of the public. If you look at something like the National Trust, they have five million members. These are all people who care about the natural environment. And there are many people. How do we tap into all those eyes and ears? So when you take your dog for a walk in the morning, you walk past the same trees. You're likely to be the first person who's going to see a change in the health of that tree. And many of those outbreaks, the Asian longhorn beetle outbreak, for example, I talked about, that was found by a lady in her back garden who picked up the beetle and said, what's this? It wasn't a trained professional because they weren't in her garden. So actually, there are many people out and about amongst trees who could be looking and could be reporting this. So this concept of triaging is, is absolutely key to the way we work. Central to a tree health early warning system is obviously a reporting mechanism. And one of the things that came out of the ash dieback uh, issue was actually a central recording mechanism called Tree Alert. And this is managed by uh, Forest Research. Uh, and this is where the information goes into. So you have your statutory services, your National Plant Protection Organization. You have your citizens. We're using Opal Tree Health Survey to support them. We have Observatory, which I'll talk more about. Uh, and then down in the bottom corner, we have all those other stakeholders, all those people involved in the industry who could act actually be the first reporters, but we have a central mechanism. All that data goes into Triolate, and that is handled by Forest Research, and they will identify what the next action might be. It may well be that information is something they expected, it's useful information, but it doesn't warrant actually sending out a forest or a tree health or a plant health inspector to actually go and investigate, is that the first outbreak of a particular disease? So that triage system works very well indeed. 
So I'm going to talk to you about uh, the observatory program. This was a four-year funded program by the EU Life, which finished uh, about two months ago. But because it has been so successful, even without the European funding, all the partners want to take that project forward. It's working with Forestry Commission, Forest Research, Woodland Trust, National Trust, Animal and Plant Hay Plant. Plant Health Agency, uh, Natural Resources Wales, and also Ferro Science Limited. And this is actually using the volunteer network of the Woodland Trust. We have about 200 to 220 trained volunteers uh, who uh, are based around the country, and they are actively looking for different tree pests and diseases. We've trained them to look for about 21 different pests and diseases. What I find amazing is the amount of time that they have put in. They have put in 13,000 hours in four years. They have carried out nearly 3,000 site surveys. They're not paid to do this. They do this because they want to do it. We invest a lot of time in training them and teaching them and supporting them and encouraging them, but all the time they give up is the time that they give up freely. So they are fantastic. The observatory volunteers have made a real difference. These are the 21 uh, pest and diseases. I talked about having 1,000 pest and diseases on the UK risk register. These are the 21 pest and diseases which are of the greatest interest to us, but also are suitable uh, for citizen science to go and survey for. So you'll see there is ash dieback on there, there's oak processionary moth, there's acute oak decline. There's a really good range of different pests and pathogens that we ask them to go and look for. So these are some of the pests and pathogens we asked, you to, asked them to look about, but I thought it would be also interesting to go back from where we started on, is talk about ash dieback. So how many of you have seen ash dieback? How many of you are confident in saying seen ash dieback? Sadly, there are too many hands going up. That is the where we are at the moment, unfortunately, with ash dieback. Um, it was a disease first really reported uh, in Eastern Europe in the 1990s, probably originated uh, in China, we suspect. Um, but it was first found in this country by my laboratory in 2012. That was the first finding of ash dieback. In that six-year period, there are now about 13,000 sites with ash dieback. About 50% of the 10-kilometer grid squares in this country now have ash dieback. It obviously is a serious disease, only a fraxinus, so it is limited to that genus. Uh, and it causes a, a variety of different um, symptoms, which I'll show you on urban forestry and nursery trees. This is the very characteristic symptom you might see on a mature tree, a lot of dieback. But the symptoms that you need to be looking for, it's a fungal disease, it produces spores that blow around in the atmosphere, they will land on the leaf surface, they'll infect the leaf, they'll go down the vein of the leaf, into the stem, and then when that stem inserts into the, uh, the branch, inserts into the stem of the tree, you'll get that very characteristic diamond-shaped lesion on the tree. That is all dead tissue. That has killed all the vascular tissue that is responsible for the movement of water. So the first thing you're likely to see is a wilting of a young tree like this. It's very easy to recognize the symptoms on transplants, so on, on regeneration like this. So the first thing you're likely to see is wilting. The leaves will dry, they'll hang for a little bit, and then eventually uh, the leaves will fall off and you get this very characteristic dieback symptom uh, uh, as the name would suggest. But the key thing to look for is this uh, longitudinal necrotic lesion on the main stem. Trying to identify it on large mature trees, I think it's pretty challenging. If you're not sure, then look for the regeneration underneath and see whether you can identify the symptoms. Uh, as you can see, the uh, initial findings were in 2012 in the light green, and you can see there is quite a, a, an eastward uh, distribution of that. The introduction probably occurred on infected planting material, but also on spores blowing in from continental Europe. Probably that's why there's a greater deposition down the east side. Uh, I live up in, uh, in Yorkshire, so there's a little green spot up there. So that is Hornsey Mere, which was one of the first findings. A lot of the findings around there is because my son plays a lot of cricket and I spend my time at the weekends looking for ash dieback as a citizen scientist. So what is really interesting, when you first get an outbreak of a new disease like that, statutory services will all rush out and establish, is this a single or a small number of outbreaks that we could eradicate and deal with? But we soon realized in a matter of weeks that actually that was not the case. 
So therefore, we realize we're not going to eradicate it, we're not going to contain it, but we are still interested to know the distribution and the spread of that disease in this country. But it's not such a priority in comparison to other new and emerging diseases. So this has been a great project for citizen scientists to discover the distribution of ash dieback. A lot of these red squares in here have been carried out in, in Wales. It was by a single observatory volunteer who has 70 grid squares in this country that he has found. So this has been a really good project. The symptoms are easy to recognize. It's very easy to report to Trilla. And any of you can report uh, symptoms of ash dieback. We're particularly interested in those blank squares. I don't believe a lot of those blank squares in England are actually negative for ash dieback. It's just that someone hasn't got a cricket playing son or hasn't been out or reported it. If you see ash dieback, check whether it's on there and report it. So that's a really good project for ash dieback. But again, for a lot of the pest and disease I talk about, there are UK distribution maps down to 10 grid square detail. So if you are thinking about planting and you're aware of a new pest or pathogen, find out whether it's in your area or not and whether that could cause you further problems. Uh, emerald ash borer, this again is uh, a really damaging pest. Um, it uh, is native to China again and to Asia and has been introduced into North America. It has caused absolute devastation of fractional species in North America. It is an absolutely beautiful beetle. They're called jewel beetles because they're iridescent green blue. They are stunningly pretty. Um, they're quite small, so you can imagine if you're trying to chew out from the, the whole, uh, uh, you're trying to chew, chew out from underneath the bark, you're not going to chew out a big hole. You're going to squeeze out the tiniest, weeniest little hole possible. So not surprisingly, the exit hole is D-shaped because the beetle is D-shaped. So what you're looking for is this beautiful jewel beetle and these D-shaped exit holes on ash trees. The adults will feed on the foliage and cause quite a lot of feeding damage and defoliation. But uh, it's really actually the larval stage that lives underneath the bark and is chewing away at that sapwood, which is killing the tree, which causes the dieback that you'll see. Um, so it is quite a, a very damaging pest. These are some rather uh, shocking figures from where it has been introduced into North America. It was believed, although it's not known as fact, that it was probably introduced on, infect on infested wood packaging material that hadn't been uh, properly treated in the early 1990s. I think it's now in 30 US states and three Canadian provinces. It hasn't killed 20 million Fraxner species. It's killed nearly 50 million Fraxner species. It was declared the number one invasive species in North America ever. It has been that damaging. Its cost is in the order of two billion pounds to the economy. Um, it's probably spread in those regions by actually infested firewood being moved around from county to county and state to state. And as I mentioned to earlier, ash supports 995 different species in this country alone. So ash is, as the third most important tree, is a really important uh, tree for our natural environment. This was worrying enough um, until uh, you start to see some pictures here. So this is three year difference between these uh, street trees in Toledo and you can see the amount of damage it is causing. It is a very devastating disease. When we became even more concerned was when it uh, popped up in Moscow. Uh, and there is now an outbreak of emerald ash borer in Moscow, and it is spreading out at Moscow at about 30 kilometers a year. You can see in this bottom picture here, um, it particularly likes urban trees because they're quite stressed. The adults prefer to feed on stressed trees. Uh, and what happens, you get a girdling of the stem, it kills the upper portion of the tree, and then you get uh, that uh, classic epicormic shoot growth flushing up from the bottom. Always thinks it looks like a little bit like a ballerina. But it is really important to remember that emerald ash borer prefers stressed trees. We've got ash dieback in this country. We have a lot of stressed ash trees in there. So if emerald ash borer does come in, it could cause even more damage than we potentially have seen in North America. So that is a real concern. Um, so again, it's thinking about growing healthy trees and trying not to stress them. Uh, finally, as a, uh, a particularly relevant organism, particularly this region, uh, is obviously plain wilt. 
which is a major problem of uh, plane trees. Uh, and it's, it's something which is a really good example where the London Tree Office Association has really taken hold of this, realised the risk and done a huge amount of work to actually go out and understand it and really get involved in that. It's a really nice interaction with the way the stakeholder has shown some really strong leadership in there, supported people like the Arboricultural Association and obviously other initiatives as well. Again, it's another fungal disease caused by Serrata cystis platanii. So again, it's quite closely related to Dutch elm disease that's a similar related species so you can see the sort of damage that a particular pathogen like that can cause um, so what it tends to do uh, it's a wound pathogen so it will infect trees that have been wounded whether that's uh, by arboricultural work or whether that's by physical damage and the spores land on the wound it then gets into the vascular tissue the tree tries to fight back and there's a bit of a battle going on but during all of that process the vascular tissue gets blocked so the first symptom you're likely to see is wilting, yellowing of the leaves. And again, it can be quite one-sided on a tree because one portion of the vascular tissue gets blocked, um, but then it will spread over the entire crown of the tree. And here you can see, so again, a uh, very good example here of some very poor-looking trees uh, in, um, I think this probably is in Spain or Italy. It's not in this country. It is uh, a major problem in uh, North America. It's on the East Coast, north in California. But it was introduced into Italy, they think, during the Second World War on contaminated um, uh, packaging material for ammunition. So the wood can actually be responsible for harboring the disease and importing. So actually they believe it was infested wood or infected wood that it was introduced. It's in Italy, it's in Spain, it's in France and a small number of other countries in Europe. It's not in this country by any shape or form. But it's a real concern to us because of the importance of uh, Platanus. Um, it causes these very characteristic symptoms uh, on the main trunk here. Uh, you get these bark cankers. Again, it's killing the bark. Some of those bark cankers can expand to two meters in a year. It can kill a tree in two to six years. It can be a very damaging disease. Uh, you get this staining of the wood underneath, um, and it's a major problem. The important thing to remember, it is a wound pathogen, so it's looking for a wound. If you have a perfectly healthy tree that isn't wounded, it's not going to be a problem. It's spread by airborne spores, it's vectored by insect, and it's spread on contaminated kit. So if you have got contaminated machinery, equipment, tools, if you're not decontaminating that, that is one way it's going to be spread. It can be spread on wind-blown uh, sawdust, and it can also survive on infested or infected wood for quite considerable time. So it is a major problem. It is one of those diseases, if you understand how to manage it, Firstly, you can prevent it from coming in. If it ever does arrive, then because we have good knowledge and good understanding, we can actually contain it and eradicate it quickly. Uh, so there is, a, there is a promising future on the way that we are dealing with it. And I say the London Tree Officer Association got some really good guidance, some really good advice, and showing some great leadership here. So again, as we close the end, we think about plant biosecurity. There's a really good campaign managed by, uh, by, by the Forestry Services, which is called Keep It Clean. If you haven't seen the Keep It Clean campaign, this is really helpful, simple advice, directly available for sort of people like this, and it's really helpful indeed. Our Boricultural Association, again, has some really good advice on bi plant biosecurity as well. So there's some really good, helpful information out there. What I would say to you, first of all, if you want some practical advice, make yourself aware of the potential threat. Look at the UK Risk Register, think about what species you have or you're going to plant, understand what the risks are, understand what the distribution is. There's a lot of, available, a lot of information available online, but also talk to your plant health officers, talk to your tree health officers, talk to your um, uh, uh, tree officers association and ARB. They will provide you a huge amount of useful advice. Think about good biosecurity uh, guidelines. You want to prevent the introduction and you want to prevent uh, the spread about that. So again, there's a lot of good practical advice about good biosecurity methodology. And finally, if you have suspicions, it doesn't matter how small it is, if you think you might have seen the first finding, or if you're not sure, something unfamiliar, something new to you, report it. Don't just go, oh, I'll, I'll see how that goes on. Report it. And that is the tree alert tool. That is a central tool that anybody can use. It doesn't matter how small or how large the issue is. Please report it via tree alert. Okay, thank you very much for your time.
Charles, I, 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 we're not asking any questions yet, but I, I feel that I have the uh, privilege of asking one. And uh, I know, it, it, you know it's a tough question. You mentioned that there are 1,000 uh, uh, pests and diseases on the uh, risk register. You didn't mention Xyella. Okay. How concerned are you about Xyella? Yeah, so uh, just Xylella is a, a, is a bacterial pathogen. Uh, Xylella has been around the world uh, for many, many years. Where it suddenly became a problem, how we don't know how it got into southern Italy, but is killing vast numbers of uh, olive trees in southern Italy. It has killed tens of thousands of olive trees in southern Italy. The difficult thing about Xylella, it has a very, very broad host range. I think there's about 350 different plant species that can suffer the consequences of Xylella. So it has a major impact potentially on a very wide range of plants, not just herbaceous plants, but also trees as well. It has spread into some parts of Europe, so there have been further findings in other countries in Europe. It hasn't been recorded in this country at the moment, but the implication of Xylella being introduced into this country would have a major impact on our ability to trade and the impact actually on that grower and the surrounding area because of this very broad host range indeed. So Xylella is a serious threat. We have put a lot of information out to raise awareness about Xylella. It really is about managing uh, the import of plant materials. There's six species of plant which are highly susceptible and most likely it's going to be introduced on that. So there's a lot of regulation, a lot of control and a lot of management around that. A lot of actually organizations saying, actually, we're not prepared to take a risk in, in trading with that very high risk material from those countries. We're not going to do that. It's not in our own best interest. So again, look on the Forest Research website, look on uh, DEFRA Plant Health Portal. There's a lot of valuable information there about Xylella. Make yourself aware of the symptoms. If you have any suspicions, again, so, uh, report it through Tree Alert or through your plant health officer. It's a, it's a real threat. We need to get ourselves <coughs> aware and knowledge about it as quick as you can. Thank you. Okay, our, our last uh, presentation is Anne uh, Jalazo um, from uh, TDAG, uh, from the uh, Tree Design Action Group, and, uh, and her title is Working in the Wider Context. So I'm an urban planner, so I come from a different background from the, the speakers we've heard so far, and I've, I've been privileged with uh, working with the Tree Design Action Group for a number of years now, trying to harness some of the evidence that's out there and trying to help compile it in some documents that are accessible. And the perspective uh, that I've taken for this presentation is uh, very much inspired by this in terms of uh, I've looked back at the case studies we've published over the past um, now five years and looked at people who and examples where um, there had been a, a really either um, uh, purposeful and, and uh, considerate decision-making process in terms of the species that were selected for a project, in terms of going past that threshold of finding the right plants that will have a chance to survive in a given environment, given the constraints uh, of the site and the project, and then delivering a range of ecosystem services on the back of that in order to really um, deliver value for money to a, a given project. And through those examples, I'm going to try also to touch on what it takes to do it on a single project basis, but also what does it take and what questions does it raise when one tries to scale up the approach for those of you who are responsible for managing or responding not just on a project by project basis, but also managing a whole tree population in a given area. How do we scale up these issues of tree selection and how do we embed it into our strategic document um, so we'll have a look at some examples that I've come across in the research I've done for the Trees and Action Group of places that I've wrestled with those questions. <coughs> so I'm going to start with the London project. And um, this was a really, um, it, it really surprised me when I came across this project. It's Cheapside, right in the heart of the city corporation, the city of London. And on this project, um, which the area is really going a really strong regeneration, lots of retail and commercial uh, floor space being redeveloped, streets really changing character, and they've really widened the pavement by, I think, uh, three meters, narrowed the carriageway, 
And you would have thought that that alone would have been what have caused uh, real uh, concern and would have been uh, maybe um, challenging in terms of agreeing those type of drastic changes to the, to the streetscape. But what was contentious on this project was the three species choices that were proposed by the uh, open space team within the city of London. And there was a very uh, prolonged battle with their urban design colleague. The issue on this east-west street is that you really have very different microclimates on uh, each of the different sides of the street. And on the one side gets really exposed to uh, sunlight and to reflected heat. You see the type of uh, glass facade, whereas the other is almost constantly in the shade. And, and the proposal from the very sound proposal from the open space team was to, to say, no, we've got to go with different species on different sides of the street here. And this was, culturally, this was unacceptable for the urban design team. Like, no, no, we're doing an avenue. You, should, we don't, we, you, don't, you don't plant different species on either side of the street. And it took a lot of work and a lot of convincing for the open space team to get to this solution. And you'll see now a little better here, the species difference is very visible in, in, the, in the autumn, where um, the sweet gums or liquidum baurientalis, you know, really show, uh, have a very different response to, and, and the trees are doing fantastically. And you can see um, here that to the streetscape, in that streetscape that whilst it's part of the historic network of, of the London street network, it's not a historic street. The, all the building forms around is, is contemporary. Um, it, the, the street facade is very well held by the buildings. So they've chosen for as a regular planting as they could, given the parking bays and etc. But there was nothing in the historic context, the landscape character, that warranted a single species choice. And doing that edu educational work in terms of uh, helping the urban design calling realize that the only way they were going to have actually a, a, a thriving avenue of trees was to choose different species really took a lot of work. And um, when I did the interviewing for writing up this case study and I spoke to the urban design team, still they told me, still we were really concerned we're going to have two different species on either side of the street. Uh, they went for it very reluctantly. And I've um, recently had an opportunity to uh, revisit some of the case studies that uh, we have in our documents. I'll talk about that in a minute. And I, I, I followed up, and, and, and they've now recognized, again, I spoke to the same people, and they recognized, said, well, we have some really, trees are really thriving on this, on this street. It's really successful planting scheme, because we're planting in very constrained and hostile environment. So that educational work, once one has um, uh, assimilated the knowledge and the type of mindset that is embedded in the street space selection guide that uh, Henrik and um, Andrew have spoken, have described to you, I think there's then a cultural shift in terms of then putting that knowledge into practice and realizing some of the um, perhaps preconception that sometimes people take in terms of what a, a tree-lined street should look like. Um, here's another example and a, perhaps another um, preconception would be perhaps to a strong word, but uh, something of less of a habit of, of using evergreen, especially like conifers in that, in that example on, on streetscape project. Very seldom, very rarely seen in this country. It's seen quite a lot now, a lot more, especially Hack Hackney has a lot of examples, but there aren't that many boroughs that are using uh, evergreen trees. They offer a lot of advantages, uh, quite a number of, of those species in terms of uh, some, a lot of them, I mean, like in this example, our pioneer species would do very well in that kind of very open, exposed environment. Um, in this case, one of the ecosystem service beyond the trees absolutely had to survive in that project. You, know, you, would, you could argue they always have to, but in this context, there was a, a sort of extra risk that was taken. <coughs> I am missing my image. Mm. Okay, we can't see the before picture. Well, I don't know what happened to it. This was, uh, this is Leonard Circus, uh, very near Old Street. 
and it had a big, the, I'm not sure which way it was turned, but the layout was, I might be turned around, there was a dual carriageway sweeping around, and um, as you can see, you no longer have neither signs or lines on the, on the, on the, on the carriageway space, and the only things that provide the clue as to how to navigate that four-way junction are the trees. So if, if you have tree failures there, it, it's not just that you, you lose an amenity element to your streetscape. You're, you're losing the single clue as to how to navigate uh, this particular element of the, of, the, of the street space. And so the choice of evergreen was even more important because the trees as a visual clue, they have to be very visually prominent all year round. And so they had to be surviving very well those conditions just so that the scheme would work. And in terms of the scheme would work well, you had to achieve that visual prominence and hence in that particular case, the choice of uh, evergreen. I, here's another example. Sorry for the, this shouldn't be there. Use of evergreen. Uh, this is in, uh, in Lyon, and I'm going to talk more now a little bit about, about uh, Greater Lyon and their work um, with trees and their, the, how they think about and their approach tree selection. Um, this is the redesign of uh, a town center, and uh, here there's uh, a small park and a plaza, and it's right in front of the city hall. And they went for a whole planting scheme that was using. Um, Conifer, now that part of uh, the Lyon suburb is called Tassin. And in, in Tassin, you have quite a lot of um, large gardens with a lot of, of uh, ornamental uh, evergreen, ornamental conifers. And so the choice in terms of uh, the streetscape element for that, that area was in terms of echoing the, the treescape that's found in, the, in the, some of this private garden was also to bring some of the conifers in in the public space. Um, whereas in an urban extension, um, like Satonay, this is also a completely different part of the metropolitan area of, of Lyon, former uh, military base, completely barren. The choice here, again, you can see this multi-species choice, uh, it's always almost the case with the uh, with Lyon project. Here's the element that they were looking was, uh, and the, the element that they worked with, what, what Henrik talked about. The trees that invest in the good stuff and the long, get, that takes longer time to build up, and the trees that are quick going. Now, Satonet got residents really quickly, and because it's a very large site, uh, you've got this phase development, and they didn't want to have residents ending up in this very barren landscape. So what they've done in a lot of the plantings is that they've mixed. Um, species that have a different uh, growth rate. And here, in that case, the fast grower is the, is, are the willows. And, uh, and they've combined them with some alder trees and, uh, and oaks, Quercus frenato. And the, the, the goal, uh, you can see here the oaks because they still have some of the leaves. Uh, they're much harder to distinguish on the summer photograph. Um, here they, they, they're playing with that, that time difference to achieve instant impact uh, without compromising the longer term uh, of establishing uh, a, a, a long-lived landscape. Um, and the trees will be managed and removed progressively to, as the oaks uh, get larger uh, <coughs> over time. Uh, I thought I'd show you the magnolia uh, that... Uh, Henrik had mentioned, Stockholm's mag magnolia. This is another element of, uh, of indeed uh, making tree, sp tree species choice work and is indeed to work on the quality of the planting environment that you provide to indeed be able to uh, afford more less common species. And move, you know. So here's the magnolia thriving in Stockholm. That's a photo proof. I, I just, when he mentioned it, I added it quickly so, so I could show it to you. Now, one project that uh, some of you will probably have, if you've heard talked to uh, uh, earlier during earlier presentation uh, in the past couple years, you might have heard me speak about this project. I'm going to really focus on the tree species element today. This is um, a project that runs through the heart of uh, Lyon. It's a 2.6 kilometer 
long project that's being done in tranches. And at the moment, they've done tranche one, and just tranche two is opening. Uh, and it represents, I think, about half of that 2.6 kilometer stretch. Garibaldi goes through um, the city center, and it is right next to the uh, railway station with a high-speed train coming from Paris. It has the Lyon's central business district uh, with quite a lot of uh, floor space. There, there's half a million of people that come in and out of the train station that's right up beauty the street. And in the... Um, Late, uh, late 60s, early 70s, that Garibaldi Street, which was a um, historic tree-lined uh, tree street that dated back to the 19th century, um, was turned into an urban motorway with underpasses at each intersection. You can see uh, an example here. And it's the focus of a streetscape project that uh, looks like this today. That's the after. This is the exact same location as the before photo. Um, one of the changes that you see is that this building that you, you couldn't see in the before, um, the regeneration of the central business district is made very successful by the investment in terms of public realm that is happening on that particular street. Some of the drivers for this project were uh, Lyon is trying to compete with Barcelona, Berlin, Copenhagen to attract um, headquarters, and it realized that the quality of its public realm was going to make a really big difference if, if it wanted to compete with other European capitals in being a, a meaningful destination for, for headquarters, and, and Garibaldi is definitely a project that's aimed at that. The other aspect, it's part of <laughs> Lyon's wider metropolitan-wide strategy to um, deliver or enable a shift away from motorized vehicle for short daytime trips. Lyon is in this very, um, in this valley, and it was one of the cities that had the highest uh, levels of air pollution. And it, it has taken since the mid 1990s some very stringent uh, and uh, aggressive, an aggressive approach to trying to deter people and offer alternatives to people from away from using cars. Um, one of the concrete translation of that is, has been not only the, the creation of a very extensive public transport network, a uh, very extensive uh, cycle network, and a reduction of the allocation of space to cars. And here in that instance, they've gone from six lanes dedicated to cars to now only three, with one dedicated bus lane, very, very wide uh, footpaths, and we'll see a cycle pass. This is a cycle pass. And in the space um, that is freed through that, provide some planting to create the type of environment that, it, that is attractive for people to walk through. Then third driver is for Lyon is uh, adapting to climate change. Uh, there's two things in that. There's the heat element. Lyon didn't have a Mediterranean climate until very recently, and now it spends. It has. It can have three. Last last two summers, it has had more than three weeks with over 30 Celsius degrees. The temperature during daytime would would always get go to that at least that level. And, and Neo isn't equipped with a tradition in a built environment. Not the offices, but the residential, the sort of six, seven stories building that are in the city, of, uh, city center of Lyon. There's no air conditioning. Um, that, that wasn't the type of summer temperature. So if people are going to um, be able to uh, feel comfortable in the city, and even more if they're going to walk, or even wait and wait for the tram standing, you have to have uh, an environment that is, uh, that is bearable. And one way is that uh, Lyon is uh, approaching this in terms of uh, helping the resilience of the city is to really invest strongly in vegetation for localized cooling. And this is where we go back to what Stania was presenting. And the way, uh, and the second element of the climate change adaptation work that they're doing is to dealing with the stormwater runoff. Lyon has a zero uh, pipe policy for its public realm projects. 
So any time it, it uh, creates a new street or does refurbishment on existing streets, it, it tries to find a way to not send the water or as little as possible to the combined sewer network. Um, in that case, they're now sending all the water from the footpath, the cycle path, um, into swells, into those planting strips, and also some of the runoff from the um, bus way uh, when, it's, uh, when salt isn't being used. Now, the excess water is, putting, is uh, stored in the former underpass, that you can see have disappeared from the after picture, and that's made available for uh, street cleaning and for irrigation. Now, the reason why they use irrigation is not so much because the planting hasn't been designed uh, having drought tolerance uh, in mind. It's because one of the things that they're really trying to optimize on that particular scheme is um, the evapotranspiration power of the trees. Um, so in terms of the species choice that they've gone for, um, they're really working with rather different conditions for those two planting strips that are right along the carriageway where the cars are, and those that are more on the out outside. And the existing trees are all London plains. I'll come back to this in a minute. So on this, right along the, the carriageway, um, it's much, obviously, much higher level of pollution. It would fit in the transport corridor category of the tree species guide. Uh, very strong exposition to pollution and, and road salt because it, it, whilst it gets hot in the summer, it gets, can get cold in, in the winter in New York. Um, it is much uh, drier, much less access to water. It's whatever falls right there on site, but there's no runoff that is being directed to those two strips. And in terms of maintenance, the ability to do any maintenance is very limited because this, those strips can only be accessed if you have in terms of, say, irrigation, you have a bowser on the street, or if you need to do tree works, if you're, uh, you have to, to, to do temporary road closure. And this is still remains an important thoroughfare in, in Lyon, even though you know, they've really reduced by half the capacity. Nonetheless, it's still an important avenue. So in terms of maintenance, it, it had to be low maintenance planting. And also, one of the key parameters was to maintain forward visibility. You know, you have a lot, uh, it's an area of Lyon that's on a street grid, so you have a lot of intersections. People have to be able to see what's the color of that light, <laughs> that traffic light coming. Uh, is there a pedestrian crossing? <coughs> um, so forward maintaining forward visibility was really important. Garibaldi connects <laughs> some really important large green space within you, two big parks. So it is this, an aspiration also through this project to enhance uh, ecological connectivity through the urban fabric. And for those two strips, the idea was, well, actually, we don't want to bring the insects at ground level, and we don't want to bring the, the, if we're supporting ecological connectivity, we only want to, the, the canopy is as far down as we want any wildlife to come. Um, on, the f on the outside, it's completely different. And so the choice they've gone for here, they've worked at improving the planting site by using um, a structural uh, soil so that it, under the footpath, so that those trees, not only do they have a, a linear trench to explore, but they also laterally can, um, can dip into a really widened rooting environment. They've, um, so the site is very comparable to a sun-exposed scree slope with rooting condition that provides good aeration and moderate retention of water and nutrients. And in that case, they've really therefore gone for pioneer type tree species. Um, you can see that they have chosen a combination of tall growing, medium growing, and small growing trees, depending on how far from the intersection they were, and uh, there's a pattern uh, with a mix of species that has been introduced. Whereas on the outside, between the, the footway 
and the cycle pass, the conditions are quite different. Pollution is lower, we're further for the emission source, as, uh, as Rob was describing. The conditions are much wetter, but it's a weird mix that uh, sometimes uh, the ground can get saturated when there's rainfall and there's a lot of water coming in, but because it's a very well-drained soil, it can also go through periods of drought. So you have, that, you have to have that tolerance to drought and tolerance um, for sometimes saturated soils. Um, it it's can be much more maintained, and because you have pedestrians that are walking right alongside of it, perhaps there's a desperation for a much more manicured look or feel. And in terms of ecological function, this is where also uh, the, the, the goal is to really create uh, foraging and shelter, foraging resources and shelter for wildlife, especially crawling, fly insects, and birds, um, which they feel also contributes for the appeal of the people uh, to use the spaces. Um, and the species there, um, they've got some tall growing trees, uh, again some pioneer species, and some uh, smaller growing trees. Some of them, whilst all of the trees along the carriage are single stem, here they try to introduce a lot of single st of uh, multi-stem species, of multi-stem version of some of, this, of the species, with uh, a lot of them, the smaller ones are really geared towards uh, the ability to provide food and, and habitat for the, for the wildlife. Um, bird cherry, um, hazel, uh, European pyrus perester, um, the common spindle, and, diff and the, some sorbus are on the outside of the swell where it's drier. Now, that's one example of a grouping of trees. They have actually three modules that they use alternating and depending on how exposed to the sun or how much in the shade, because there's some sections, um, it's a northwest street, and there's places where you have tall buildings and places that are where, where the buildings are lower, and the, the, the shade that's cast kind of varies. So according to that, they have two or three of those uh, different mixes that they, they work with. Here you see on that photograph the um, and for those areas that are between the footpath and the cycle lane, whereas on, on this area you only had an herbaceous layer and the sing trees, si all single stem. Here you have an herbaceous layer, an arbustive layer, small trees, often multi-stem, and then single stem trees. So you have a very layered landscape, and I'm not even going to go through to describe what their choice is for. Uh, ground cover and herbaceous layer. This again to support uh, insects being and birds coming all the way to the ground as opposed to being kept at canopy level <laughs> on the... Now, I mentioned the importance of this project and one of the driver for this project was uh, for the urban cooling. They've been doing a lot of monitoring of the results that they've been achieving through this. The whole strip has been geared with uh, tensionometer, looking at how water penetrates, gets into the ground, how trees uh, absorb that water, as well as uh, there's been also um, um, temperature, temperature measuring device put on the trees and on the strip lamp post away from the trees. I don't have the data to share with you. It's, very, it's not in a format that can be shared. Hopefully, we'll be able to share that data soon in terms of uh, the evaporate respiration of the trees. But what we have is uh, good data now on the impact this, this project is having on the um, air temperature. And this is localized effect of, uh, in terms of cooling. And what they've, they've found is that um, in terms of, if you look at just temperature, um, the average gain is, uh, between, is around 2 to 2.5 degrees. And if you, the temperature measured, um, the temperature measured on, on the, so they've been taking temperature at a, there's a weather station near Bron, 
that's very close to the street. There's uh, temperature measurement on the tree and there's temperature measurement on the lamppost that is about 20 meters away from, from trees. And if they have that setup uh, that repeats along the street. And systematically, the temperature on the trees was, uh, was uh, lower, there's that lower line around on the graph. And the higher one was the one always on the, on the lamppost. The figures that I think have been most interesting is that when they've tried to translate, not look at just temperature, but actually the temperature with, which we experience, taking into account moisture in the air and um, reflected heat, the actual experienced temperature is nine Celsius degree lower if you account for those other parameters. So in terms of creating a giant localized air conditioning system for that uh, Rambla style avenue that is being created in, uh, right in the city center of Avenue, it is actually really working well. What they don't know is how much water they need to give when there's a drought using that water that's stored in the former underpass to maintain the evaporative power of the trees, how, how much, how long, and this is what they're trying to calibrate by also measuring the evapotranspiration and the water usage of the trees. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that this data will become available in the next six months, but that's something that they're working on. So quite a sophisticated approach there to trying to deliver benefits on the back of choosing the right tree and creating the right type of place uh, for trees to thrive and deliver benefits. Now, now, so what has enabled this is in terms of uh, delivering this kind of approach is having agreed on a strategic framework. In New York, it's called a tree charter. And on this tree charter, it has eight principles. They're listed here. And you have really, the first two principles are really about tree species choice. There's a really strong strategic commitment to diversification and, and also a commitment to providing year-round landscape interest, which is, uh, and what's interesting is that uh, for those two principles that um, in terms of their work on, on, on diversity, they're really talking about what's called what they call locally informed diversity. And what they mean by this is that it doesn't mean that because we're trying to create, uh, choose the right tree for the right place and also at a city scale we're trying to build an, a resilient city, tree population that we don't have sometimes single avenue planting, but those would be, would need to be required by the context either because of the historic character of a given area or because there's a really, there's a landscape really needs to have a unifying power in which case perhaps sometimes maybe two species would be acceptable or a, a form of a pattern. And what they've done to help have a, a more informed debate around the use of a, of a more diverse species range included on a single project by project basis, which as you've seen, they tend to do, is that they, they work within the context of landscape character assessments that they've done for each, uh, not just municipalities, but neighborhoods. And that provides a frame of reference to um, understand perhaps if any given area has some constraints, for instance, soil constraints that needs to be taken into account on a systematic basis, but also in terms of <coughs> delivering a landscape that's suitable for the character of the area. And that's within those landscape character areas that, that uh, helps guide the species choice that, that then that applies the approach that uh, Henrik and Andrew have been describing. The impact has been... Uh, an increase, so they've been at this, the first iteration of the tree charter was uh, issued in the early mid-1990s, and since then, they've increased um, uh, the number of, total number of species found in hard landscape. I'm not talking about parks and uh, green space, I'm only talking about public realm, hard public realm planting. They've increased by 80%. Um, there's 300, I think, 30 species found in the public realm across Greater Lyon. Uh, so they've been really, uh, oh, I'm wrong, 280, sorry, species um, found in the public realm. And they've managed to go from a situation where London Plain, uh, which was 52% of uh, the tree population in number, 
even a greater number if you looked at the canopy cover in, in 1994 to now being uh, just under its 21.7%. Uh, that's a really an astounding result uh, in terms of managing to diversify. And the second largest here uh, quarter on this pie chart is this other category that has uh, 84 genres. So uh, they've, they've really been successful in, in, uh, in diversifying their tree population. They still are vulnerable, uh, but they're much, it's much, they're much better than where they started from. So all the information on the species that are on the streets is publicly available. There's a visualization tool that is not fancy at all, but it does the job. You can find every tree in the, in the streetscape and know what species it is. For professionals, uh, this, this information can be downloaded in many different formats, AutoCAD, GIS, etc. Um, that's just an example. So in terms of scaling up, a number of, of um, takeaway points from my perspective is they have a real commitment at a strategic level to choose species displaying the characteristics and growth pattern that will best suit a given site. Most of the tree strategies or policy position that I've seen in this country related to species selection often focus on emphasizing the need to select species that are native to the UK, rather that over choosing the, the, the tree that will be best suited for the site. That's a tendency I've seen here. Um, not to say that there aren't cases where native is, isn't the right choice, but, but, but making it the only priority or the only thing you say about species choice uh, in your policy position or in your, in your policy document, I think is problematic. Um, second, a commitment to species diversification, uh, again, right embedded right through strategic documents, and uh, with this understanding that uh, diversification is to be informed, to be made uh, uh, socially acceptable, back to the cheap side example. Um, Area-based framework to respect local characters and identity. Data sharing and transparency, you can't expect professionals, um, expect, you know, uh, consultants, professional submitting projects to know what your local tree population is and to help you reach your target if you haven't made that information available to them. And in those towns and cities that I've seen that have been very, very successful at working at diversification, Melbourne is another example, the level of transparency and data sharing on species is, uh, and tools made available for people to know what's out there on the street is, is really um, quite astounding. And a supply chain wide effort that's really so partnership led. The tree charter isn't just a Greater Leon document, it's co-signed by the nurseries and some of the primary landscape contractors and landscape designers in, in that are locally operating. And Greater Lyon has shifted the way it supplies trees from a place where in the 1990s it, it bought about 60% of its trees from uh, outside, from northern, from Italy. And today they, this, they, they buy that amount from localized nursery. So they've worked hand in hand with their local nursery to grow a set of qualified you know, professionals that were supplying them with the type of products they wanted. And along the way, they've worked with also a lot of local landscape designers. Lyon does virtually no in-house design. They commission everything. Um, and so they've grown um, and helped the market really be able to respond and meet their standard. They don't have tree planting lists for each of the area-based framework. Everything is negotiated, but the city of Lyon set the parameters in terms of the landscape character and also in terms of the existing population profile. And they have also strong expectation in terms of trees thriving and delivering benefits. And that provides the context for a conversation on a side-by-side -side basis. I'm done. I will mention <laughs> lastly, if you tweet about today, would you please? I've put the hashtag TDAG tree selection. All the examples I've, I've touched upon today are existing case studies. And, not, and in addition, case studies that we've recently updated, they are online on the TDAG website. You can go have a look. You can download them if you'd like to send them to clients. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>